Matt Diavella is a YouTuber and documentary filmmaker who produces a lot of content around the minimalism movement. Matt has created two Netflix documentaries around minimalism and built a large following on YouTube in a very short period of time. At the time of recording this, Matt has nearly two and a half million subscribers on YouTube. He also runs a podcast that is available to his Patreon supporters that unpacks the thoughts of some of the world's leading authors and thought leaders to understand more about their lives and how they work. Matt describes himself as an experimenter, as someone who is striving to learn more whilst being able to take his audience on the journey with him. His content is very addictive and immensely useful, and despite being a minimalist, his content doesn't alienate anyone outside that sphere. I was introduced to Matt's archive of content in late 2018, when talking to a former member of the press here in Birmingham. He highlighted Matt as a content creator who has really changed the way he sees the world, and after taking the time to delve into his content, I understood why. I'm not a minimalist, and I don't think I ever will be, but this interview really changed my thoughts on minimalism, what it means to be a minimalist, and the relationship that I have with money and possessions. In this interview, you will learn more about Matt's story, how we in today's world are living better than the kings of our past, and how taking on certain mindsets and ideas of a minimalist doesn't necessarily require you to strip yourself of all your possessions. I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and the first of the Pathfinders podcast with YouTuber and minimalist Matt Diavella. From 99% Lifestyle Magazine, this is the Pathfinders Podcast. I know your story is already out there, Matt, but just to get things started, could you please give me a short outline of your journey to where you are today, just to give people a bit of context about your path as a creative? I've always been interested in filmmaking. It was the one thing that I really excelled at early on. It was the one thing that you didn't have to force me to do. So I spent many lunch hours, after school hours during high school, just working on sketch comedy videos and video projects for school. And then was able to turn that into a freelance business later in college and then was able to turn that into a bit of a documentary career, and most recently into creating documentaries on YouTube. Something I wanted to talk about is, I actually read an interview that you had done, and it mentioned the fact that just after you left high school or college, you ended up being sued by a grocery store for making a rap video, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Unfortunately, that is a thing that happened in my life. Um, I, I mean, honestly, it was actually overall a pretty good experience looking back at it. It was the very first time, I guess the, the first time that I noticed one of my videos made a significant impact beyond maybe a group of friends laughing at it. So throughout high school, I worked at a grocery store and I worked in the produce department with my brother. My dad happened to be the produce manager and it was just one of those jobs that it's so boring and there's so much drudgery through it and there's not a whole lot of like mental stimulation that we had to just find ways to be creative and my brother and I were both into hip hop so we would just write these really terrible rap lyrics and uh, definitely inspired by YouTube which was just starting around the time 2006 and 7 uh, and a lot of the Perry rap videos that were coming out at the time so we decided just to like for one of my school projects create a parody rap video And this was, you know, at this point we were in college. I was still working summers at the grocery store. And then we made this video. It was a bit inappropriate. There was a lot of uh, like just silly potty humor about pretending to pee on produce, like uh, when a rude customer would approach us. And we put it up online, you know, a couple thousand views, surprisingly, like pretty decent for not having any subscribers. And then... We ended up getting fired because somebody complained about the video. You know, it happened to be that the thousand people that saw the video were within our community. <laughs> and so they, they, we ended up getting fired. And then a week after we got fired, we got a call from a reporter from the 100 and Democrat, a, mag, a, a newspaper which circulates to half a million people. And he told us that he was going to be running a feature on the front page the next morning about how we were getting sued for $7 million dollars and wanted to know our comment. And then we were kind of just thrown into the spotlight, into this 15 minutes of fame where we were on national television. We had, it was kind of like a big story that week. It was Mm. these two produce brothers got fired for making an inappropriate video, got like picked up in a limousine and brought to New York City. And it was a wild experience for a college student who had never seen more than a thousand people watch his video. And now hundreds of thousands of people were watching 
us on TV and in the YouTube video we made. And it was a long process. We ended up getting lawyers to help represent us. And within a year, it was a pretty long year, we were able to finally get the, the lawsuit removed. We were able to settle out of court where we didn't uh, take a financial hit at all from that. So it ended up being, in the long run, it was a learning lesson too mm -hmm. about just making sure we have our legal bases covered. And especially today with copyright lawsuits and stuff happening more frequently, I always try to make sure I'm a little bit more careful when it comes to legal issues. Mm. Yeah, and you've already answered my next question because I was actually going to ask, um, looking back now, all that stressful times out of the way, what was what was it you learned from that situation? But yeah, you've already answered yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there was a like, real stress in the very beginning and stress throughout it. I think we probably didn't take it as serious as we needed, needed to at the time. I mean, now you look at uh, people like H3H3 on YouTube who get sued and it can really destroy your life, even if for a year or two, which is, is something that I think most people should try to avoid. And unfortunately, you sometimes if you're making content and videos that are a little bit edgy, you always run that risk. Mm, yeah, yeah, okay. And uh, after this point, is that when you got onto shooting weddings and doing some freelance jobs after this grocery store job? <laughs> yeah, so after... So I ended up getting fired. We never got our jobs back. And then it's just trying to find ways to make money. I started working for the school, making videos. I did apply for another grocery store job in my college town. Unfortunately, I didn't get it. But I just started to make money making videos. And it was when I transferred to Temple University, I got one of my first legit freelance jobs where I was paid $100 to follow around a clothing brand for the day and document their story. And this was before the wave of DSLR filmmaking, so it wasn't as common just to have somebody following people around filming and kind of creating this doc-type footage. But uh, that was really an eye-opening experience for me. Like, they went to an ATM, they pulled out, the CEO pulled out 100 bucks, handed it to me. Seems sketchy in hindsight, because he pulled it out of an ATM in, like, a Chinese restaurant. <laughs> and... It was, but it was also just an opportunity for me to realize, like, wow, I would have done this for free, and now here's somebody paying me money to make videos, and it was a very long process to make a sustainable and profitable company, but that's where it really started, and that's where I started to believe that it could actually happen. And you talked about that you was making, say, like, your own original content before that, um, but when you started doing freelance work, was you still doing that original content as well? Was that... Was, or did that come later on? No, I actually had a little bit of a stint in college where I did some stand-up comedy and I worked with some friends who also did stand-up and we made sketch comedy videos. Not a whole lot of it, nothing that really built up any momentum. That was always kind of the dream of mine ever since I was younger was to get into comedy and do sketch comedy. But when I started to make money as a freelance filmmaker, I just realized I didn't want to be splitting my time between these two pursuits and I needed to focus on just one. And I was seeing, I loved filmmaking and I was seeing a return on that. I was seeing the fact that I was actually starting to make money from it. So I decided to put a pause on the, the comedy, the original projects and just focus on trying to build up this business and also trying to pay off my $100,000 in the student loans. You talked about that you was making your own original content before that. But when you started doing freelance work, was you still creating this original content or did you do that later down the line? It wasn't to promote myself. It was at a point where I was ready to shift. So I had just released my first feature length documentary to Netflix, which is called Minimalism. And at that point, I just saw the response to it and I realized I would much rather create my own original work, my own original projects, whether it's a five minute film or a feature length documentary than execute somebody else's vision and somebody else's idea, which I had been doing. I enjoy, I loved my freelance career. It was a lot of fun. I worked with some amazing clients. I was very lucky to work with clients who allowed me a lot of creative freedom, but still they would never give me the kind of freedom to just make whatever I wanted. So I knew that I had to take control of my own path and the kind of projects I wanted to create. And for me, it was about creating 
self-reliance really like creating and building an audience that could support the work that mm-hmm. I was creating so that's when I mean this was probably to early 2017 when I decided to change this path in my career uh, along it was kind of a back and forth where I was doing some freelance gigs doing YouTube and but I, the, the whole goal was to eventually stop freelance completely which I did within a year to just pursue original content and that's quite amazing at the fact that you kind of did that in 2017 with the follower you followers you've got now did you build up kind of like a follower base from doing freelance projects or the documentary film um initially no it was all purely through youtube was it it was all purely through youtube i had no following i mean i don't remember what my specific numbers were it could have been like 2000 twitter followers probably less maybe like a thousand uh 500 instagram followers youtube i had a couple less than 100 i think it was just from i don't randomly people subscribing to the couple vacation and personal videos that i had made in the past because you know i opened up my youtube account years and years ago but i just never uploaded so i even through creating the documentary didn't have anybody that was really following me like mm-hmm. it maybe a tiny trickle up but it was once I then started to create this original content, I, it was really starting from nothing. And it was, people didn't know who I was. The fact that I made the documentary that some people had seen, I think gave me some credibility once they came in the door. They're like, oh, that's the guy that made that movie. But I still had to get them in the door. Hmm. And that happened quite quickly because a lot of YouTubers I've spoken to, they talk about how um, their followers normally comes from a natural um Um, organic organic way that it just slowly builds up over time but because you did that so quickly was there a period where you gained a lot of traction all of a sudden or was it just a gradual procession over the that short period yeah it was there was a couple big spikes i i was creating a podcast excerpts from my youtube channel and experimenting with blogging for about a year and tiny trickle up uh, I had at that point maybe I had three to five thousand subscribers over the course of a year, which is just a little bit here and there. There was no big spikes, and then I made a video called "My Minimalist Apartment," which was really just me showing what my apartment looks like, but also uh, I brought to it I think a little bit of humor. I tried to like not take myself too seriously. I tried to crack some jokes throughout it, and also just try to put a lot of effort and energy into it, like the same kind of effort and energy I would put into my client work, I decided to put into a YouTube video. So that that video specifically was shot like on a red camera. It was very high production value and it ended up paying off. I don't think you need a red camera in order to get a lot of views. Like there's a happy medium there, but it was the fact that I think what really helped me was an interesting topical video that had, uh, high production value that people weren't used to on YouTube and that video took off at this point it's got over a couple, I think a couple million views at this point but it quickly went from like 10,000 to 20,000 30,000 within a couple weeks and this is the first time I was able to step back and like oh okay this is what people are responding to and it helped me to shift away from just uploading excerpts from my podcast to being hyper specific and thoughtful about each video I create on my YouTube channel to the point now where I don't upload excerpts. I don't upload just simple talking head videos. It's one video a week that are really thoughtful that I think will connect and resonate with the audience that I've built. And that happened quite quickly. A lot of the YouTubers I've spoken to have said that their audiences grew naturally over the years rather than say having big spikes in growth. As your growth was quite quick, did you have any spikes in growth at all? I think that's a, that's a big reason. And I think also being a, a guy and having a little bit of a different perspective on minimalism. There were a lot of women talking about minimalism on YouTube. And as far as I know, Anthony Angaro from Break the Twitch is one of the only like male YouTubers discussing minimalism at the time. And I actually had a call with him very early on. Uh, because I just wanted to get some advice. I was just heading into this. He was actually starting to create and do freelance work at the time. So we hopped on a call and just kind of discussed what was working for him on YouTube. And I was just explaining a little bit about my freelance career. But 
it was and now I think if you look on YouTube there's quite a bit more YouTubers in general talking about minimalism it has has gotten even more popular with the rise of um, you know Marie Kondo's Netflix special uh, Netflix documentary series so I think that it's something that's going to continue to grow but I think that no matter what you have to do something a little bit different you have to come from a different angle and perspective if you want it to like resonate and actually grow mm, okay straight after you was in college you ended up buying a car and I've heard you talk about how it didn't really make you too happy afterwards when you discovered minimalism it seems like everything kind of fell into perspective for you about what truly makes you happy. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, so I graduated with $97,000 in student loan debt. Then I bought a brand new car, moved back home into my parents' basement. I, At the time, all my friends were going out with their starting jobs, their starting salaries. They were making money, buying stuff with all the money they had and everybody's sharing it on Facebook and Instagram, and I'm seeing it all while scrolling through my phone in my parents' basement, and I'm just realizing that I am not happy. I'm not happy with where my life is. I'm not happy with where it's going. I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, and I'm buried in this, you know, close to $120,000 in debt. Like, how am I ever going to get out of this? And then late at night, I'm just watching this interview with a guy named Tom Shadiak, who was talking about how he had, he was, he's this big Hollywood producer, worked with Jim Carrey on some of the greatest 90s comedies, and he was talking about how he got rid of everything, and he decided to, to pare down and live in a trailer park, a beautiful trailer park home in Malibu, versus the 10,000 plus square foot mansion he was living in. And it got me to think just about my path, and it was this crazy idea that oh i don't have to wait until you know this point in my life until i i'm happy i could actually be happy with what i have right now because i do have enough i have enough to be happy i have enough to be content i have family and friends who care about me i may be in debt and i may not be where i want to be in my career but that doesn't have to affect my current well-being i can still have ambition and i can still want to work towards creating a better life for myself but it doesn't have to really affect my well-being and my day-to-day happiness so that's when i first started thinking about simplicity eventually i found out about this term minimalism and then all these other bloggers that were talking about it and it got me to just redefine my idea of success and i think that was the biggest effect that it had on me it wasn't the getting rid of the stuff and donating my clothes to charity and getting rid of old baseball memorabilia that I was holding on to since I was eight years old. It was the fact that I didn't, I felt like I could just enjoy the ride and enjoy the process and not feel like I always had to get to that next step. And this must be something you probably have to do quite frequently, but how do you describe minimalism to people who perhaps don't understand what it is or might have some preconceptions of the fact it's, you know, just getting rid of everything, living in a a white room with no furniture in or something like that? Yeah, I think that minimalism is really, it's a lifestyle that gets people to question the things in their life and the things that they've decided to focus on in their life. And by doing that, by getting rid of the stuff in our home and our apartments that we don't use, that we no longer get value from or get joy from, we're able to then reshift our priorities and focus on what's important to us. So it gets us to ask really important questions about ourselves like you know should I be focusing this much time watching TV and um, you know just kind of grinding it out at my job or should I be and I am I truly happy in my job am I truly happy working all these long hours to buy all this stuff that isn't actually bringing me happiness so when we shift our priorities we can then focus on the things that we really care about, but it starts with asking questions about the things that are in our lives and how we want to create and design a life that we actually love. So before we did this interview, I watched the minimalism documentary that you created and it's out on Netflix. And something that it touches on is our relationship with possessions. And something I wanted to talk to you about is why as a society we see possessions as this stature of success almost has this been the cause of marketers using techniques to sell us 
things through like the radio, TV, etc. Or has this been something that's been about long before then? Man, I think it's been around for a while. I think just material success and material wealth. I mean, you look back at, um, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, those who have the money and the power uh, and have this, they have the status. That's something that's desirable and that people want because then you're a bit higher up on the social hierarchy. It's easier to get what you want. People respect you. You're probably going to survive and live a lot longer. There's a lot of biological urges that I think come with that. And for us as a society, it's, it's obviously more and more people have been able to get more and more stuff. And to where we're living like kings of 500 years ago, like the average American is. So why aren't we happy? Why are depression and anxiety rates increasing? And I think it's because, one, we're just comparing ourselves to people who have even more. And as the wealth distribution has become more and more misaligned and as we're comparing ourselves to people on Instagram we feel worse about ourselves and so I think that's one of the reasons why minimalism has connected with people is because it's kind of getting off that treadmill and getting off this cycle of constantly feeling like we don't have enough to realizing that actually we do we have plenty enough to be happy um, but it's often hard when we're you know, we're, we're so tightly wrapped in the society and I'm no different than anybody else. Like when I see other people with like a really nice, I go to my friend's house and they've got a really nice apartment. I can often feel like, Oh man, I wish my apartment was this nice. Oh, I wish I had this. This is so nice. But then you just have to continually remind yourself that, you know what, I'm actually completely content with what I have right now. doesn't mean that I'm not going to change things in the future and the stuff that I own tomorrow is going to be different than what I own today. But it's, it's just about mindfulness day after day, making sure that we don't lose track of what's really important. I know that the documentary looks at this as well, but do you think that there is a sweet spot people can get to where they don't have to strip out all their possessions, but can get rid of a lot of things that don't personally give them value? Yeah, and I think that's the one thing that, the one most common misconception is that minimalists get rid of things that they love and that they value and that they get a lot of joy from which is the complete opposite of the point. The point is to get rid of the stuff that we don't use, that we don't value, hopefully give them to somebody else who can get value out of them. Uh, But if you're depriving yourself of good things, then I I think that you're missing the point of minimalism. I do think that in some experiments, it can be helpful to kind of push ourselves to understand, hey, what would it be like to only spend $200 $200 this month on groceries. Like if things really got bad for me or if I lost my job or if I was no longer able to pursue the career I am and I had to reduce my income, my expenses and, and have those constraints, I think that can be interesting to do even when we don't have to. But I don't think that's the point of minimalism. The point of minimalism is to uh, just keep the things in our lives that we value, we get joy out of and get rid of the other stuff and if, if i always say like if you're having that hard of a time about something about like getting rid of a sentimental item like a mug then, then keep it you know it's probably because it has a lot of joy for you but if you feel that way about every single thing that you own and you haven't already done this process of going through everything if you just if you're basically like a hoarder then i think there's maybe a deeper issue where you need to understand like uh when it's time to actually let go And uh, going back on to the documentary, um, how did you go about making that documentary with zero budget? And also, how do you go about getting something like that onto Netflix as well? Because there's a lot of filmmakers that do read this uh, publication, and I'm guessing some of them will be wanting to know, how do you get your work into the decision makers of uh, places like that that can distribute your work? Yeah, so... The one thing that I think helped us is I shot and edited 99% of the film. I had towards the end, I had a couple friends help me out with specific shoots and interviews that I did between Boston and California. But for the most part, you know, I did it all myself. I also we had a couple uh, friends help out with color grade, sound design, and all that stuff. But the idea was just. I had built up all these skills doing freelance work for years and years. And even for the YouTube channel, like none of this stuff is overnight success. It's like 
you don't see the 10 years of work that led to me becoming experienced as a filmmaker. So I had all these skills as a filmmaker and I decided, you know, it was the right time for me to drop a majority of the freelance work I was doing to pursue creating this feature length documentary. It was, I think for a lot of filmmakers, especially people who are into documentaries, that's kind of like the North star. It's a big bucket list milestone to accomplish to create a feature length documentary. So this opportunity came up, Josh and I uh, had a phone call about it. He was, had uh, the, he was the one that first approached me with the concept of making a documentary about minimalism. And we just started making it, you know, we, I went on tour with them. We filmed a bunch of interviews while we were on the road. And then I started editing it together, realized that we missed a bunch of interviews. We had to go out and keep shooting. So it was about two years on and off of shooting and editing from 2014 to 2016 to the point where we had a final film and no plan for distribution. We had no idea how this was going to, who was, nobody had signed on to buy the thing. Uh, but we did have Josh and Ryan from The Minimalists who had a very large following. They had a couple million people every year that watched their stuff or that read their blog and uh, followed them on social media. So we knew that was the main plan was, hey, let's just release this independently, we'll put it up on Vimeo, we'll put it up on iTunes, and we'll figure out how to do that. And it wasn't that difficult to get it up on these platforms and to start to actually make money from it. Uh, I don't know. At that point, it did very well. Like it topped the charts on iTunes for a couple days, and uh, we made our money back pretty quickly from the money that we invested in the project, which was about like, you know, I think we ended up investing like fifty thousand dollars into it at the end of it. So we made that money back pretty quickly through that independent release, and then within a couple months, we were able to negotiate a deal with Netflix, and that came through just connections that we made uh, through some of the, we did a little bit of a theatrical run for distribution and we were able to make a connection who knew somebody who knew somebody. <laughs> and then they got us in the door at Netflix. And I think part of it was the fact that it had done well already. And I think they saw that it was resonating with people. So that's what I always tell people too. The distribution plan doesn't matter if you don't have a good documentary or a good film, make an amazing film first cut an amazing trailer from that and then try to get in the door, try to find somebody, maybe an executive producer that you can bring on that has the right connection. And if you have a good enough film and a good enough product, the doors are going to open, but you can't do it if you're, if you're selling shit. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I totally get that. And if, if there are, is someone out there that is talented, that starts with zero connections, would you say that it's all about developing that network around you? And it's basically who, you know, that can get you these opportunities rather than starting from zero. Or nine times out of ten, anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, there, there's obviously both to it because I think for me, a majority of my work has always been solo and independent. There's an amount of luck in terms of like you find the right opportunities, and I've never been a great networker or connector. But when even I, I got in touch with Josh and Ryan from The Minimalist, it was just through seeing that they were looking for a filmmaker to help them shoot an event. And I was like, hey, guys, I really love your work. I would love to, you know, shoot your event for you. Whatever you'd be willing to pay me, I'd be happy to do it for. And that was the connection that then led to us making the documentary together and then them having the audience to be able to uh, push this out to. So that's, I think, the biggest lesson for if you are an independent creator, if you want to make a documentary or a film and you don't have an audience, but you're really good at what you do, if you can connect with somebody else who has an audience, who has an interesting story, you're both providing something really powerful that could then reach a whole lot of people. And you don't need to get it on Netflix or Hulu or Amazon. You can put it on Vimeo or you can put it on iTunes and you can just sell it yourself. And I guarantee you'll probably have just as much success and, and you'll make probably just as much money than if you were to get it on one of those platforms. After the minimalism documentary, you ended up creating another one called design disruptors how long after the minimalism documentary did you make that was that still before you was on youtube it was before youtube i didn't start youtube until i had finished both documentaries but there was some overlap and design disruptors was a client funded project so it was a client envision that i had worked with for years and years 
and the CEO Clark just reached out to me and said, Hey, I want to do start. It was going to be a short documentary, like 20 minute documentary about the changing landscape of product design and how it's influencing some of the world's biggest companies like Airbnb, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. And we didn't have those, those companies signed on at first, but we kind of just started and we did a bunch of interviews, uh, talked with a lot of design leaders at these companies. And then those, ended up opening the doors and within the industry people started talking about this documentary design disruptors that Envision was making and other people wanted to sign on to it and there was a bit of overlap for me in terms of creating minimalism and design disruptors and trying to balance both of these at the same time but yeah that was definitely um, an interesting peek for me into a world that I didn't really know much about mm. okay okay and um, one thing that I found really is the one of the things I really like about your content as well on YouTube is um, is how it is very uh, knowledgeable and it's very um, actionable, the stuff that you talk about. And something that strikes me is the fact that you come across like you're very organized and you're very focused. How do you keep uh, organized and focused? Because uh, one of the videos I, I watched, which I really enjoyed, was talking about your daily routine. And I know that obviously changes fairly frequently, but it seems like that you've got a good organization and structure to your life. So how do you do Yeah, it? I think the, the biggest thing I do is I don't do a lot. Uh, I try not to bring on too much, even interviews like this. Like I don't do that many interviews, and I oftentimes don't do things that are in the middle of the day. So if it is an interview, I usually schedule towards later in the day. So I have a whole block of my day from when I wake up at 6 a.m., until usually around 4 or 5 p.m. where there's nothing scheduled. I like to fit some time for healthy eating in the gym and some of my own personal activities towards the middle because I do think that having a healthy lifestyle and spending time on myself, that's one of the best reasons uh, or incentives for me to pursue my own thing is that then I just have time to focus on my, my health and my well-being. So besides that, my main focus is limited to the films that I create, maybe the podcasts that I make, and that's it. So it helps my productivity to make sure I don't have all these micro interruptions and disruptions from checking my phone on social media. I really make sure that I don't even keep my phone near me when I'm working, and I delete Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, email, all from my phone, so I don't have, I can't quickly access them, and I'm not quickly distracted. Because like for a filmmaker, oftentimes we're like maybe waiting for something to render, we're compressing or exporting something, uh, something's not loading right away because it's a big file, we're importing this file, and the, the first instinct is, oh, let me look at my phone, oh, let me pull up email, let me look at this. So I try to eliminate as many distractions as I can, and then I just focus on the things I need to do. I think the biggest hurdle a lot of people get is the work in the beginning, like how do you actually sit down and start working? And it's something that I, that I continue to struggle with. I always recommend Stephen Pressfield's The War of Art and another book he made called Do the Work, where you, you have to overcome this procrastination battle every time. Every day is a battle to sit down and do the work. But once you do sit down and once you do get started, it's very easy to, to get into a state of flow. And so oftentimes... If you just set a timer for 30 minutes, say, I'm just going to sit down. I'm going to start working 30 minutes. That's all it's going to, that's all I'm going to do. After that, I can stop. Normally, by the time you get to 30 minutes, you're, you're already in that state of flow and you forget about the timer and you just keep working. Um, so yeah, I try to keep it as simple as possible and I try not to schedule too much into my day. Mm, okay. And does your schedule tend to be kind of planned out for a week or a month in advance? So do you allocate, say like, okay, every Tuesday is going to be the day I look at the podcast every you know, uh, am I going to do a newsletter today, uh, every Wednesday or something like that? Or is it quite flexible? I, so I used to do my podcast in person. I'm, I'm making a shift to my podcast now, but I would batch my podcast episodes where I would do three to four podcasts over the course of two days, which worked, but also I did find that it turned it more into a job than I would have liked. Um, that's one of the problems with batching things. I think batching is incredibly helpful if you say hey i'm only gonna check email for an hour during the day and it's at this time i think you're gonna end up increasing your productivity and saving yourself a lot of time the problem with doing that at a too large of a scale is that it does feel like work it does feel like um a bit more draining than it is fulfilling 
So I try not to do that too much. I recently moved my video release to Tuesdays. It's a weird move, but I was releasing them on Mondays for the longest time. And I was talking with uh, my partner, Natalie, and she was like, man, it's too bad that you didn't set it for Tuesday because, you know, you find yourself working on Sundays a lot if you're running behind on videos and stuff. And I was like, oh, that's a good point. So then literally that day I decided to then move my videos to Tuesday. It gives me a little bit more time on Monday. Mondays is now usually a day for me to touch up my videos, make sure everything's ready for the release on Tuesday, write my newsletter that I release on Tuesday in alignment with my video. And the other days of the week are freed up to creating, editing, filming. I do, I've been doing more and more interviews for my YouTube channel. So I usually schedule them from Tuesday to Thursday. I don't like scheduling things on Monday and Friday. I like leaving them open just in case you know, I want to have an extended weekend or if we're going to go on a trip somewhere, it just keeps me more flexible. Mm -hmm. Also planning things on a Monday, I feel like is always a bad idea because you just want to make sure that the people who are doing the project with you, the person that you're interviewing is ready for it. And sometimes Monday is a day for catch up. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, it's hard. You can't confirm with somebody Sunday night. Hey, are we still good for tomorrow? <laughs> because it's the weekend and I feel like that'd be rude to do, but yeah, it's not – I have some systems in place, but for the most part, I keep my schedules open. And I've been doing this long enough that I don't need to kind of block out every single hour of my day. And do you allocate a time to switch off as well? So is it like as soon as it hits perhaps 5 o'clock every day, I'll switch off and I don't work on the weekends, or is it not that intense? I switch off when Natalie comes home. Okay. That's my – which is, is really helpful if – if we weren't dating, I would have to like set a time, but she comes home usually between five thirty to six thirty, and I, you know, I just know okay when she's home, I'm gonna turn the computer down. That's time for us to either cook some dinner, just to talk about our days, and spend time together. So for me, that's a really helpful uh, trigger. And yeah, I usually start a little bit early in the day too. So I start around like six. Well, I wake up around six. And then I usually get to work by around seven. Mm. And then, um, yeah, so I feel like that gives me plenty of time to get the work done that I need to get done. Mm. Okay. And do you not work on the weekends either? Or do you still find yourself doing stuff then? We are doing a thing this year because last year was the last year was when I was building up this business and I was sprinting and it took a lot of energy, a lot of time. I knew that I had a limited amount of runway before I was going to be able to make this thing sustainable and make a living as a YouTuber and a original filmmaker. So I worked a lot of weekends, a lot of Saturdays, Sundays and nights and super early mornings. And then towards the end of last year, when I was able to fund my Patreon and just make a living as a creator, I decided to, to pull off the gas a little bit. And now we do no work Saturdays. And it, which is turned into outdoor Saturdays. So every Saturday we, we go outdoors somewhere, we go for a hike, we go to the beach, we do something outside that gets us out of the house, but we also commit to not working. There are very few times, I mean, we're pretty strict about it, but there's been once or twice where she's had to work because of a pitch that she's working on, and um, that's totally fine. But Sundays, usually we don't work, but sometimes it's, hey, you know, if I want to write for a couple hours in the morning, for me, it's like my work doesn't feel like work. I love it so much, but I just know I don't want it to creep into my personal relationships. So the reason why I put these restrictions on myself is more so for my relationships than it is for me and my own well-being. Yeah, yeah, I completely get yeah, it because I, I really enjoy doing this magazine as well. I find myself working on it 24 hours a day. It seems like seven days a week. Uh, yeah, for sure. Mm. <laughs> So the final thing I wanted to talk about is the Ground Up podcast, which you run. And I just wanted to know a bit about how this came about and why you wanted to start a podcast. Yeah, the podcast was the first thing that I started to do in terms of creating original content after my documentary. And I had been a fan of podcasts. I enjoyed listening to them. And I thought, I could do this. And I think I could actually uh, bring something a little bit different to the table with high production value in terms of the videos. And this was two years ago. And at the time, Joe Rogan was doing video for his podcast, but nobody else was. And since then, we've obviously seen tons and tons of people, especially people like creating high quality videos uh, for their podcasts. 
I was like, this is one way that I can differentiate. Uh, if I can get some big guests on, some notable guests who have large followings, I could then create teasers for their Instagram and Twitter account that they could then share that could hopefully grow my uh, audience. That was one of the earliest strategies that I had, uh, apart from just creating as quality content as I could, was, hey, if I just get guests to share these clips that are really interesting or make them look really smart, then they'll then obviously, you know, a dozen, two dozen people might come follow me from that. And that's the same thing I experienced starting out my freelance career is that like there's a lot of like, you just got to take everything you can get in the beginning. You got to work as hard as you can because there's no guarantees that it's, that it's going to work. So, and the podcast just became, I'm going to hit a hundred episodes next week. It just became a, a really awesome way to meet and connect with people. I met a lot of friends that I still have to this day through just interviewing them on the podcast, an amazing way to network and connect with people that I otherwise wouldn't. There's only so many coffee dates and beers that you can grab with people. But if you're, if you're going in the purpose of uh, exploring a topic, sitting down and recording a conversation and creating this piece of content, there's a lot more incentive to do it. Hmm. And that's really interesting about that strategy is because I've spoke to quite a few people who run podcasts and none of them have talked about that they've used that strategy before i spoke to a, a few smaller podcasters as well and they've said that they've tried to get guests on in the hope that they'd share it and um, get some of their followers as well but nine times out of ten it wasn't successful do you think that by creating like a short teaser or something was taking away um taking away too much effort the interview we perhaps had to do in order to share it and the fact that I'm guessing these teasers were very high quality that you was making as well yeah I think they had to be high quality if you're not giving them something that they couldn't produce or something that they're not impressed with then they're obviously not going to share it a lot of times people would just say here's the link can you share it and they make it very hard they go and I got to write up this copy and I got to do all this stuff um, so even if like maybe you take a high quality photo when they come over the place or for me, like when I did the, you know, I, I'm not, I'm switching to doing not video anymore cause like, it worked for me at the time. I'm just taking a little bit of a, a breather from filming every single episode because of the amount of work that goes into it. But it was really effective strategy. You have to make it as easy as possible. And I also just kept thinking about it from their perspective. Like what kind of teaser would they be happy to share what would make them want to post this on their Instagram? And then how can I make it as easy as possible for them? So giving them a download link, giving them not too many options, not 12 teasers, but giving them two to three options that they could look through. Uh, and I knew that just with the production value itself and the music I could bring to it, uh, and oftentimes the B-roll, I would like go outside with the guests and shoot some B-roll of them walking around the block just to get some uh, to create a nice, it was all really for those teasers on Instagram and Twitter. And I definitely saw a pretty significant boost from those. Like I, I mean, I think at one, one month when I had a ritual on my podcast, who's an ultra endurance athlete with a really large following, I went from like 3000 downloads in the month to 8,000, which was a huge jump up for me. And that was, it wouldn't have happened just by having him on my podcast, it happened because he shared the teaser from the episode. That said, the biggest growth, the only reason I was able to take it from that 8,000 to like then over a million downloads, not a million a month, but just a million total, was from just creating great content, great videos and films, having people come for me and not come for my guest. And that was definitely the biggest uh, I think it was necessary to have that small bump and to have that really slow growth in the beginning to then uh, figure out what was going to work for me personally. Mm. And now you've got a big following for the podcast. Do you still do these teasers as well? No, I actually stopped doing the teasers months ago, probably like three, four months ago, just because you have to continually do this. The things that maybe worked in the beginning, the things that helped you build an audience might not be the things that you have to continue to do. So I had to just look at, hey, where am I spending my time? Where is my energy going right now? Let me actually shift my priorities here and focus more on creating eight to 12 minute YouTube documentaries, which are connecting and resonating. And that's where my biggest growth is. And I'm not even gonna use Instagram. I'm gonna rarely use Twitter. I'm not on Facebook at all. 
I just totally, it actually stemmed from me quitting social media for 30 days and seeing the biggest spike I'd ever seen in my audience. And I was like, oh, okay, I don't actually need to spin my wheels on social media to get an extra 5% growth. I can just focus all my time and energy on YouTube, at least for the time being, uh, because that's what's really working. And um, if, say, from this point onwards, no one was to listen to your podcast, but you were still able to get the guests that you wanted to get on, would you still do it as a way of learning yourself? Um, so basically how I'm, I'm shifting things is where the first 100 episodes of my podcast were about meeting new people and having conversations uh, with people that I am just meeting for the first time. I want the next 100 episodes to be me connecting and building deeper relationships with some of the people that I've met through the podcast and some of the other people that I've met in my life. Because I think that you can get a little bit deeper on topics and you have a little bit more openness when you get past the first couple of times hanging out or talking with somebody uh, once you truly build, build a friendship. So that's what I'm interested in doing in the podcast. I am on the YouTube channel, going to continue to interview new people and create more of a documentary vibe and feel with my videos where it's not just always going to be me in my apartment talking about something. It'll be hey, let's now bring an expert to help me unpack and talk about some of the topics in this because I'm, I'm really, I don't want to, I'm an expert in a couple things, maybe filmmaking, minimalism, but apart from that, a lot of the things that I explore on my YouTube channel, I don't want to be seen as an expert. I want to be seen in as, as an experimenter. So I'm learning about these things with my audience and if I can find an expert to help me break that stuff down and, and understand it better for myself, then I think it's just going to help everybody. And do you ever struggle finding ideas or do you find yourself you've got a long list of ideas that you have, that you know what you're going to make in advance, whether that be the podcast or the YouTube channel? Yeah, I'm, I'm in, in a similar way to freelance. When you start freelance filmmaking or photography, you're kind of worried, am I going to continue to get work? Am I going to continue to get clients? In that same way, you have a bit of a nervousness and anxiety when you first start creating videos on YouTube. Am I going to have enough ideas? Am I going to run out of ideas? But I found that that's what the creative process is, is just kind of coming up with original ideas or coming up with original ways to look at an idea that's already been explored before. So, And I do have you know, a decent lengthy list of videos that I'm constantly working on and things that ideas that I get, I'll just jot it down in my notes. And so I don't, I don't ever worry about running out of ideas, especially when you look at people like Seth Godin, who writes a blog post every single day, you know, there's plenty of ideas out there. It's just the creativity and taking the time to sit down and let that come through is what's going to make the difference. So similar to what you talked about, how you didn't want to be seen as an expert and you wanted to take your audience on this journey this is kind of similar to this podcast as well I want to take people on the journey as I'm trying to learn myself and something I want to know more about is what advice that you had for people who wanted to start a podcast do it for yourself do it because you're interested in exploring this medium you're interested in meeting new people and uh because you enjoy the process or you want to learn and figure out whether you would enjoy the process. So I would say do 20 episodes, commit to doing 20 episodes, give it a shot. You're not going to build up a, you're not going to build up an audience in 20 episodes, you know, for the, for the most part, some people luck out, but now with how many people are getting into the podcasting space, it's, it's really difficult to break through the noise. Most podcasts never break a significant threshold, never break, 10,000 downloads total on their podcast. Most people give up before 20 episodes. So I would say do 20 and then ask yourself, do I really like this? Am I really enjoying this? Or am I doing it because I want to make money and I want to be famous? Uh, am I doing it for the external rewards versus the internal rewards? And that's something you always have to ask yourself. I think it always needs to be internally focused in terms of do I love what I do? Do I want to keep creating this? That's why people jump off the from the rat race that's why they leave corporate careers because they feel trapped they don't feel like they're getting the internal reward they're getting all the money they're getting the status they're climbing up the ladder but they don't enjoy it that's not saying that's true for everybody but i, I see it happen quite often and i think yeah if you focus internally that's probably the best place to start hmm, yeah and that was something um 
Debbie Milman told me as well, um, who does the Design Matters podcast, she basically did mm-hmm. say that if you were to do a podcast, do it for yourself, not for chasing the yeah. fame and numbers. So, yeah, that's Absolutely. a really good answer. And what advice would you give to people to help them become more of a minimalist, say, if they didn't particularly want to jump right into the deep end of minimalism? I think the one thing that everybody can do is start to ask some questions. Like, what do I want my life to look like? Am I really happy? And by asking these questions, by looking internally, like you don't have to get rid of your stuff if you don't want. If you feel overwhelmed by your stuff, if you feel like uh, if you enjoy the process of decluttering and get rid of stuff, then you, you already understand that there are some benefits to clearing things away. But if you don't want to, don't do it. It's, it's, really, it's really up to you. It's everybody's own personal journey. But I think everybody can benefit from asking those questions and trying to think deeper about what it means to live a meaningful life. So this was my interview with YouTuber and minimalist Matt Diavella. This interview was conducted just over a year ago now in February 2019 and first published in Volume 5 of 99% Lifestyle magazine. If you would like to read more about the world's greatest creatives and entrepreneurs then head over to 99percentlifestyle.com and have a look at our print magazines. I tend to close off every interview I do by asking the person I'm speaking to to recommend some of their favourite things in the world right now. Whether that's books, podcasts, documentaries, their favorite musicians that you perhaps haven't heard of this is a curated list that is sent to people all around the world each week as a weekly newsletter the newsletter is called creative recommendations and at the time of recording this all 126 issues of the newsletter is archived on the 99 percent lifestyle website if you would like to read what matt diavella recommended then you can read this by visiting the newsletter archive and clicking issue 88 I hope you enjoyed listening to the first episode of the Pathfinders podcast. We'll be back again very soon. Thank you for listening.